Welcome everyone to our celebration of the 2022 winners of the Fountainhead Essay Contest. My name is Sam Weaver. I'm a junior fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute, and I'm looking forward to sharing this special event with you all. The Fountainhead was first published in 1943. Almost 80 years later, it has sold at least 6.5 million copies. And ARI, the Ayn Rand Institute, has sponsored essay contests on the Fountainhead since 1986. This was in fact the first project of the Institute. Today, we will announce the winners of this year's Fountainhead essay contest at the end of our broadcast. Along the way, we want to highlight some of the exceptional portions of the winning essays and show you all one, what wonderful things this year's applicants have achieved. We'll discuss the winners of a number of prizes, not just the first place award. Uh, as you can see on the screen, we have five third place winners who will receive a prize of $500 each, three second place winners who will each receive $1,000, and of course, our first place winner who receives the big prize of $5,000. Now, one thing before we begin, uh, viewers should know that this event will discuss the plot of Ayn Rand's novel, The Fountainhead. So the event will contain plot spoilers. So there is your, your spoiler warning uh, in advance of the discussion. Uh, another message is that we want to thank everyone who made this essay contest possible. We want to thank the students who participated, who sent in their essays to the contest. We want to thank the teachers who encouraged the students and helped them along the way. We want to thank our team of graders who worked uh, long and hard on uh, grading the essay so that we could eventually choose our winners. And of course, and especially, we want to thank the donors to ARI who made this contest possible through their support. We really appreciate it. Now to begin talking a little bit more about uh, this year's contest, I want to introduce my colleague, Ben Bayer, who's a fellow at ARI. Welcome, Ben. Hi, Sam, great to be here. This is one of my favorite events of the year. Mine too. So uh, we should uh, also say a few things about the uh, kind of numbers uh, on this year's contest and a little bit on the history of uh, the Ayn Rand Institute's essay contest. So this is a contest which uh, was one of the first major projects of the Institute. It was started in 1986 and initially with just one essay contest and that was the contest about the Fountainhead. We've since added contests about Anthem and at the Shrugged as well. Over the years, we've had more than 445,000 entries across all of our contests. That uh, adds up to $2.2 million of prize money to, given out to uh, over 11,000 students. There have been just countries uh, all over the planet, uh, 150 of them or so, who've, uh, you know, where the students, uh, uh, the students who've entered the contest have lived. Uh, I should say this, contest, the Fountainhead contest in particular is of special significance to me. It's the one that convinced me to read the Fountainhead for the first time way back in 1990 something. Uh, so uh, that makes me very happy to introduce some numbers about this year's contest. Uh, we had 463 participants. Uh, they came from 18 different countries. We had 50 semifinalists uh, and uh, 25 finalists. Uh, Tonight, we're going to be talking mostly about the nine top prizes, uh, which Sam mentioned previously, but we will give some credit at the end to, uh, to we'll put the names up of all the semifinalists and finalists. Um, and I should mention that of the essay excerpts that we'll be reading tonight, not all of them are from uh, the top nine uh, winners, though many of them are. And that should give us a reason, I think, actually to tell you right now who the top nine contenders are. And we'll put that up on the screen. Uh, all of these students already know, I think, that they are among the top nine. And the, the big question is, how did they place? So we've got uh, Zara Deneva from Van Damme Academy in Aliso Viejo, California, Ryder Davila in Van Damme Academy, uh, two, two from the same school this year. 
Uh, Elizabeth Jensen, Madrid Junior and Senior High School, Madrid, Iowa. Uh, Anna Lai, JFK High School in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Sean Lee, Northview High School in Johns Creek, Georgia. Linnea Malmberg, homeschooled in Midwest City, Oklahoma. Vanessa Virgil, Parkside High School in Salisbury, Maryland. Hannah Wall, Live Oak Academy in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. And Victor Zhang, Bayside High School, New York. Sam, do you want to tell I us a little we, bit about the, uh, the the grading criteria that we used? Yeah, I think we should say a word about that. So there were a number of criteria we used to evaluate all the essays we received. Uh, so the first uh, point was that the essays stay on topic. We gave uh, we gave three topics that students could choose from. Did they stay on topic uh, to the prompt they chose? And did they answer all the parts of the essay question? Also important. And then was the essay logically organized, had a clear structure? Was it exceptionally clear? So those are kind of some stylistic uh, guidelines. And then uh, did the essay interrelate the ideas and events of the novel? Uh, Ayn Rand's novels uh, have a lot of ideas involved in them, and uh, but they're also uh, plot stories with, with exciting action and and we wanted to see essays that talked about both, connected the ideas to the events of the story. And of course, we wanted to see essays that display an understanding of both the ideas and the events. So the ideas of the Fountainhead are, are really timeless philosophical ideas, but uh, the, they have application to our lives today. And we often craft the essay contest questions in such a way as to bring that out. And that was, that was particularly true with one of them this year. Uh, so the last thing I'll do before we, we actually start looking at some excerpts and start announcing some winners is just to say a word about each of the three prompts. The first prompt this year uh, dealt with the topic of social media. And how do the timeless ideas of individualism versus collectivism, first-handedness versus second-handedness, apply to the way that we represent ourselves online today? And we got some very interesting uh, thoughts from today's students on this subject. The other two questions were more about the timeless ideas uh, as they come up in the characterization and plot uh, of, of the novel. Um, one is uh, Keating's view at one point expressed that everyone is selfish and Dominique's view early in the novel that she values a certain kind of freedom. And what does that mean? And what does the book have to say about it? So uh, without further ado, let's, let's uh, dive into the first of these questions. We're gonna show some excerpts from the first of uh, these prompts. Uh, and I should mention that the, the students that we're gonna be showing excerpts from um, are from all across the different uh, top nine slots and maybe some semifinalists too. Uh, but we'll we'll announce the semifinalists, or sorry, we'll announce the third place winners once we're done with the first prompt. So Sam, why don't you tell us what the first prompt was? Yes, so the first prompt was the one uh, that dealt with social media. Uh, the prompt reads as follows. Howard Rourke says to Gail Winand, look at everyone around us. You've wondered why they suffer, why they seek happiness and never find it. If any man stopped and asked himself whether he's ever held a truly personal desire, he'd find the answer. He can't say about a single thing, this is what I wanted because I wanted it, not because it made my neighbors gape at me. The things which are sacred or precious to us are the things we withdraw from promiscuous sharing. But now we are taught to throw everything within us into public light and common pawing, end quote. In light of this view, what do you think Rourke would make of people's behavior today on social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram? Give examples of what he might approve or disapprove of. Would you agree or disagree with his evaluation? Explain your position. So to ease our way into talking about this topic, uh, I thought that we would start with an excerpt from a student who I thought did a really great job of just introducing the issue, of, of framing the issue in a way that shows how we are struggling with this question today and how it relates to some of the themes of the novel. And this is before even getting into what the novel has to say about them. So this is an excerpt from 
uh, one of our top nine uh, winners, Linnea Malberg, mentioned before from Oklahoma. And here's the way she began her essay, which I thought was, was quite uh, well put. She says, we live in a world that pays lip service to the ideals of individualism. More now than ever before, we are told, follow your dreams, be who you truly are, be authentic. Society views identity as something which is self-determined with ostensibly no accountability to anyone else. Pop culture and the media champion, social deviants, is brave for being who they truly are. That is, unless they deviate from the common trends. The individualism of modern life is barely skin deep as it extends only to those who are rebelliously authentic in line with the current trend. Those who stand against those trends are vilified as foolish, monstrous, and worst of all, unfashionable. Their authentic self is disregarded and shunned, that is, until the tide eventually turns and sweeps such formerly traitorous opinions into the coveted spotlight of fashion. Uh, just just a, a fantastic way of beginning this essay. Um, so uh, let's, let's see then what some other students had to say about the, the real meat of the question, which was, in effect, Rourke, who's the, the hero of the story, who's the champion of independence and individualism, what would he say about the way uh, people use social media today, given that it is very much about showing other people uh, your, your, what you want them to see about you? Uh, and perhaps, as uh, Linnea is suggesting, not necessarily your authentic self. So Sam, um, you've got another excerpt from a, another student that goes into that Yes, direction. Yes, we have an excerpt here from uh, Ryder Davila from California, uh, who we mentioned earlier. And Ryder, I think, gave us a, a really vivid comparison between some popular social media trends of today and characters from The Fountainhead. So Ryder wrote, social media is an exaggerated form of the banner, which is a newspaper in the novel in that they both try to please others. Similar to Peter Keating, people often copy others and rely entirely on the content not created by themselves. People react to others' videos, reposting and posting trends such as dances on social media. Also, people will shock others, similar to Snite or Ike the Genius. People could still stun others for being original with their work, such as Rourke does. However, these second-handers are original only to shock others who are still living second-hand. This is represented in social media by people posting prank videos or clickbaiting viewers. Finally, people manipulate others, but not to the extent that Wynand and Tui do. People raiding streams or joining profile picture groups are examples of content creators controlling their viewers. One reason that I like to uh, read these essays is because it, it gives me an insight into what uh, young people today have to deal with. I don't even know what rating streams mean. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you do, Sam. Um, but uh, I, 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 I suspect that a lot of the examples that Ryder is giving here are, uh, are parallel. And I, I one, one thing I liked was the way it, the, this essay cut things up into categories, uh, different types of use of social media, which correspond to different types of you know, what what Rand and uh, Rourke would have called second-handedness, where you're not primarily interested in choosing values for yourself, but you're instead interested in living up to the values of others uh, without thinking carefully about them. And, and there's the category here of copying, of shocking, and of manipulating. In each case, what you care about really is the impression of the other, and there's a good question of why. Um, I should mention that in the second category, the one about shocking, uh, Ryder gives the example of uh, John Eric Snight from The Fountainhead and Ike the Genius. Snight did this a little bit. Ike, I think, was a bigger example of it. And one, uh, another example from the book that would have would have even fit better, I think, into this category is somebody like Lois Cook. She's the, the avant-garde uh, novelist who doesn't use capitalization or punctuation uh, and writes kind of word salads uh, on the order of maybe James Joyce, so that um, be not because there's obvious value to it, but because it shocks, but because it, you know, because it's different. And uh, Rand later would, would talk about this broader category as a type of, uh, a type of person who 
sort of pretends to be an individualist because they're doing something different from the crowd. But if they're only doing it to shock the crowd, what they really care about is the crowd. And uh, they're still, you know, if the crowd changed its mind, then it, they would start doing something different to shock them. So they're still following the crowd in an indirect way. Yeah, I, I believe what Ryder is talking about with rating streams is is uh, somebody, some social media personality telling their followers to go to somebody else's live stream and post a bunch of negative comments uh, in, in there. So it's definitely an, an instance of uh, a crowd activity and uh, social pressure being used against somebody that someone doesn't like. Okay, uh, thanks for the thanks for the update. Let's now take another look at another excerpt. Uh, this one is uh, speaking really directly to the, the idea that was in the quote from the prompt, the one about how Rourke says we're asked to share indiscriminately. And this is, of course, he's talking about uh, sharing in a, in a pre-social media age. But this is what Elizabeth Jensen of Madrid Senior, Junior and Senior High School in Iowa had to say about this phenomenon. Throughout the novel, Rourke demonstrates that he believes the most precious things in life should be kept and enjoyed for and by oneself. If you go on social media, you will find even the most mundane things shared, outfits for the day, pictures of meals, and in some cases, a seemingly constant record of every thought. By sharing every moment in their lives, even the most intimate, those moments no longer are uniquely that person's own, and their meaning becomes lost in the collective consciousness of the internet. Um, this is, I think this is a very interesting uh, perspective. Um, I think one, one question I think you can ask about this point is, is everything that you share with anybody online uh, the same kind of thing that Rourke is objecting to? Certainly if it is sharing everything all the time to the, to the total universe the whole, you know, in public, then I think this, this might be in fact what Rourke is talking about. Um, We'll talk later, we'll talk, actually, I think it's the next one we're gonna look at of why this does not necessarily mean that if you're someone like Rourke, you, you, you would object to everything that you could possibly share in any instance online. And Sam, why don't you take us to that last, that last uh, excerpt? Yes, so we have another excerpt that uh, makes the point that social media is not all bad. Uh, Tom Jongelin, who goes to Center High in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, raises the point as follows. I should also add that in my understanding, social media platforms in themselves are just a tool. And as such, they are neither good nor bad. Like any other tool, they may become destructive if abused and may prove constructive if used correctly. For example, social platforms can provide unprecedented exposure to voices that would otherwise be ignored by public opinion, mainstream norms, and other restrictive elements. I suspect even Rourke would have approved of a social media platform that gives independent artists the opportunity to express their unique art for all to see, as long as they are creating for the sake of creation, or even for a personal financial profit, but not for the sake of ga gaining widespread public approval. And yes, I think this was this was an important point to raise here because uh, I don't think it makes sense to say that social media in itself is is always going to be bad, is always going to be used for for second handed uh, purposes. Um, it's it, as Tom put it, it's a tool, and you can use a, a, most tools you can use for good or for bad things. And uh, here's here's an example of. Uh, some good things that, you know, maybe if you had social media in the in Rourke's time, maybe he would have had an easier time finding clients who shared his values because they could search and find his his buildings posted on the the social media of the day. So there, and uh, yeah, we are also um, we're posting on social media right now. This is a, another instance. You know, we're not doing something secondhanded here. This is. Uh, this is a, another positive use of the tool. So this was a, an important point to make uh, as a, you know, a counterbalance to some of the, the negatives that were rightly discussed in the other answers. Yeah, and a number of other uh, essays also made the same point. They, they would point out 
uh, negative ways in which social media is used, the kinds where it's a lot clearer. Someone like Rourke would never do that. Uh, but then they said, yeah, but there are there are ways you can think someone like Rourke would use it. For instance, you know, if he wanted to advertise his architecture firm to do exactly what you were just saying, Sam, to find people who actually value the kind of architecture that he's producing. The second handedness would come if he started uh, changing his architectural style uh, just to please all the people that he knew he could please on, on social media or, or something to that effect. And, and that's one of the reasons why it's important that his, uh, his quotes, the, the quote in the prompt is very, it's very precise. It says, the things which are sacred or precious to us are the things we withdraw from promiscuous sharing. So, uh, you know, even, even um, Rourke will share uh, some things of important value to him with people who are important to him. Uh, and uh, the, the cases where he'll go in public are the cases where he's trying to find his kind of people. And um, it's it's you know this is, this is a difference why it matters which kind of privacy settings you put on your on your on your social media account. You want to share some things with the public. Um, you'll share more things with people who are closer to you, people who are on your close friends list, for instance. So he would you know if if Rourke has social media, I could imagine him having a couple of things that he'd put in public, but a very narrow list of friends that he would have on a special list. You know, Dominique and uh, um, wine in for a time and um, and Mike. So let's now move to a new, well, actually, before we move to the next topic, it is a good time to announce our first batch of winners. We're going to announce the third place winners. Uh, and these are people who've written uh, on across all the topics, not just on the one that we've talked about so far. Um, so uh, let's, get, let's get a drum roll and Sam, tell us who are the third place winners. The third place winners are Ryder Davila from Van Damme Academy, Aliso Viejo, California, Elizabeth Jensen at Madrid Junior and Senior High School in Madrid, Iowa, Sayun Lee at Northview High School, Johns Creek, Georgia, Vanessa Virgil of Parkside High School, Salisbury, Maryland, and Hannah Wall of Live Oak Academy, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Congratulations to all five of you. And here are some photos of our third place winners. Well done. Very good work all. You'll, you'll see uh, some, we've we mentioned a few of those names already in the excerpts that we've done. You'll, you'll see more of their names in some of the excerpts we're about to do. And uh, those of you who know how to do process of elimination, know who's left and who's in contention now for second versus first place. So now let's take a look at uh, some more excerpts, this time from our second prompt. And our second prompt was one more about the timeless ideas of the Fountainhead and how they are expressed uh, in the plot and characterization of the novel. Uh, this is the one about, uh, well, let's, let's take a look at the actual prompt. So prompt two reads as follows. After the death of Lucius Heyer, Keating tells himself he had nothing to regret. He had done what anyone would have done. Catherine had said it. He was selfish. Everybody was selfish. It was not a pretty thing to be selfish, but he was not alone in it. And the question we asked then about this quotation was, what do you think is motivating Keating to tell himself that this is the, uh, to, 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 sorry, to tell himself this at this point in the story? What does the Fountainhead have to say about whether what he's saying is true? Do you agree? Why or why not? So uh, part of, uh, why we want to talk about this question today is that it actually connects to the previous question. Uh, the previous question was what, you know, what, what would Rourke do with social media? Uh, we didn't talk so much in our discussion of the excerpts about why he had the view that he had, about why he thought it was wrong or not always good to promiscuously share. Uh, this question, uh, the second one now is going to get us deeper into some of the ideas behind that perspective. W what is it that Rourke, someone like Rourke, would think is at stake uh, in in whether or not he puts his, in effect, his soul on display for all to see, and uh, whether or not he tries to craft his soul just to please other people. Uh, Peter Keating, of course, is the polar opposite of Rourke. Has has 
antithetical values to Rourke's. And yet, curiously, at this one point in the novel, he tells himself that he thinks he's selfish. And the question is, uh, and that would make it seem like he really cares about his self, his soul. Does he really? Is he right? Uh, why is he telling himself this at this point in the novel? So Sam, uh, I think our first excerpt has something to say about why he's doing it that's particularly revealing. Yes, I think so. Uh, so this excerpt is from Zara Deniva uh, from Aliso Viejo, California. And Zara writes, Keating tries to rationalize away his guilt over his murder of hire by saying that he and the rest of the world are selfish, and so he is no worse than anyone else. He tries to convince himself that Hire's death was not his fault because he had been acting in his self-interest. Selfishness was universal, so no single selfish person could be blamed. The whole world was like that. If the entire world acts selfishly, then it is the world's problem, not any single person's. All Peter wants is to shift the guilt and blame away from himself and onto the entire world to escape his crushing numbness. To do this, he rationalizes his guilt away with Katie's comforting words. He had done what anyone would have done. So one thing to observe in what Zara has said here is that uh, she makes the observation that this is something that Peter's trying to convince himself of. Uh, and he, he's doing it because he wants to get rid of the guilt that he's feeling. So I think that already suggests that even Peter Keating himself might not really believe everything that he is telling himself. But Ben, I think you have more to say about this. Yeah, and it's, it's worth reminding the audience here why he feels, what he feels guilty about. The, the question prompt briefly, briefly alludes to this, but let's remember, this is, he's feeling guilty because he's basically just murdered his boss. <laughs> uh, basically murdered in that, and he's one of the partners at the firm who was a competitor for the job that he wanted. He wanted to be, you know, basically to replace him. And he knew that he, if, if, he, if he accused this guy of uh, doing something uh, unseemly, uh, he would cause this partner to uh, have a nervous attack and have a heart attack because of it. And he knew that there was a likelihood that, that he would die if he had a heart attack. And in fact, he succeeds in inducing the heart attack. And so he's basically responsible for this guy's death. And so he's, he's thinking about, oh my God, I'm a murderer. But he wants to find a way of excusing himself from having done this terrible thing, even though he basically intended to do it. And uh, the thing that I liked about Zara's answer is of the questions, of the answers that I saw, of the essays that I saw on this topic, this is the one that came the closest, I think, to explaining why something like everyone is selfish would actually excuse uh, an action. Um, you might think, well, a lot of people, uh, including Keating and in many of his ex avowed views in the book, think that selfishness is a bad thing. So why, why does, why does uh, claiming that he's doing a bad thing excuse his behavior? Well, that's why the everyone is selfish part is really important because if, as uh, Zara says, it's he's trying to convince himself that this is something universal, if it's something that's kind of built into human nature, in effect, uh, then he's trying to convince himself that that nobody can avoid it, nobody can help being otherwise, and then that would also apply to him. If he couldn't help but do what he did. Uh, then he's in effect forced by his nature to do it. He has no choice about it. And if he has no choice about it, he can't be blamed. He can't blame somebody for, you know, uh, what, you know, who's, who, uh, where they were born, who their parents are, uh, what kind of genes they have. These are things beyond their control. And so if, if it turns out that selfishness is just something that's sort of built into our genes, then uh, who can blame us for being that way on the assumption that it's bad, uh, which uh, at times Keating himself thinks it is. Um, however, the, and I should mention, this is a, this is a viewpoint that uh, a lot of philosophers debate about. There are philosophers in history who've famously advocated the view that, uh, everyone in one way or another is selfish. Even mother Teresa is because she's just doing what she wants, which is to help people. So, uh, it's debated by some, but it's debated and a lot of them disagree with it. 
And so the view called psychological egoism. What we're going to talk about next is what does the Fountainhead have to say on this question? Is, does, does the philosophy of the author agree with Keating's claim that everybody's selfish, they can't help what they do, they don't really have a choice in the matter? So let's, uh, let's take a look next at actually a second excerpt from Zara, uh, which I thought was really good about putting its finger on the novel's overall perspective on whether or not Keating is right about this. And here's what Zara had to say about this. Uh, after killing Hire, he tries to convince himself that he had been acting selfishly, just like the rest of the world, so he could not be blamed. His drives were not his own, they were society's. But in actuality, very few people truly act selfishly. Most people have been filled with desires by the world and blindly follow them, but not Rourke. Rourke, the most selfish person in this novel, follows his principles and follows them above the rest of the world. So uh, this, is, this is very interesting because uh, Zara is saying the Fountainhead has the position that not everybody is selfish. Not only is not everybody selfish, but very few people are. And you can tell from the way that Zara is putting this, that uh, in the view of the novel, in the view of the philosophy of the author, uh, not only are very few people selfish, but, but the very few who are, are are actually admirable which is a this is a this is a strange thing to say this is an unconventional thing to say but of course now if you think about what we were discussing in the first part talking about the first prompt um, someone like rourke thinks that what it means to be selfish is to hold your values dear and to to see them as precious and not want to surrender them to other people so that he's selfish in the sense that he he values his work his love his friends um, more than uh than random strangers and random activities but then if that's what it means to be selfish uh well that does seem uh kind of admirable and the people who are busy uh kind of putting their life on display for the sake of other people they're not actually valuing anything very carefully they're not choosing their own values for themselves they're letting other people do it for them and that doesn't seem admirable there's more to say about this and more to and more that our essays have to tell us about it so um sam i think we've got another one that sheds more light on this yeah here's an excerpt from Sayun lee uh that get, takes a closer look at peter keating and uh i think calls into question the i further calls into question the idea that Peter Keating uh, could be considered a selfish person. So uh, Sayun writes, even when he attends the stage of the Cosmo Theater for winning the Cosmo Slotnick competition, he turned his back on his private thoughts and turned to the public for validation. He was great, great as the number of people who told him so. He was right, right as the number of people who believed it. Keating's triumph reveals his dependence on others' judgment for a sense of self-worth. Such reliance portrays that Keating empties himself of his personal values and only looks to the public's approval. I think this was a great scene to, to focus in on in thinking about, is Peter Keating a selfish character? I mean, in this scene, Peter Keating has just... Uh, just is he's celebrating one of the great accomplishments of his career he's he's at the at the top of the world so to speak he's got he's gotten this commission for a really really important building and as sayun is pointing out in this scene we're seeing that his where he he's thinking of in trying to understand his personal worth is looking to other people looking to what other people think of him the approval of the public not to anything in his personal values, any of his personal accomplishments. Yeah, and uh, the, the, the let's let's now take a look at what it would mean to actually um, be a little bit more Rourke-like. And here there was actually uh, another excerpt from Seyun's essay that connected very well here. Uh, 
this is, and one of the other things I liked about this passage I should mention is that it's clear, and one of the things we are looking for when we're looking for good essays is, is the student, like, especially when we give them a quotation to analyze, are they only reading that quotation and looking at sort of the immediate context of it in the chapter that it's in, or are they, are they looking to see how it connects to other events and other ideas scattered throughout the whole novel? And from this next passage, I could tell Sayun really read the whole thing and was looking for the same theme throughout, because this is now from a passage many, many chapters later. Uh, and this is a scene where Keating is having a conversation with, at the time, his wife, Dominique. And uh, it helps explain the sense in which Keating has emptied himself, which is the language that Sayun used in the first excerpt. So here's the passage, and it starts with a quotation directly from the story. Uh, that quotation is Keating, uh, well, actually it's an indirect discourse. Keating asserts that the soul, the thing that feels and values and makes decisions, is dead within Dominique, which is, quote, a kind of walking death that is, quote, worth, uh, worse than any active crime. He adds, quote, you're not here, Dominique. You're not alive. Where's your eye? Uh, and then Dominique makes the final blow by remarking, where's yours, Peter? As Seun continues, he's too afraid to look at his mistakes in the eye and fix them. Rather, he chooses to turn a deaf ear to the truth. Keating's refusal to acknowledge reality illustrates the debilitating pattern of selflessness. With no soul, he loses the ability to think independently. Um, I was super happy. I, this is the only essay I read that, that uh, contained a reference to that line where Keating himself says what the soul is and here soul and self i think are being used uh, roughly equivalently the thing that feels and values and makes decisions and he's saying to dominique that that she, it seems like her eye her soul herself is missing because she's being completely passive in their relationship she's not making any decisions not even the drapes in the particular room a and the uh of course, the reason she is doing this is related to the uh, issue we'll get into with uh, the next prompt. She's doing it as, in effect, a kind of experiment. Uh, it's it's not really consistent with her deep down values. But what she points out to Keating is that this is actually the way he operates uh, characteristically, that he doesn't seem to want to choose any of his own values. Um, and... Uh, so the thing that feels and values and makes decisions seems to be dead within him because he's he's given up uh, his relationship with Catherine so he can be with Dominique because Dominique is prestigious. He's given up the chance to be uh, an artist, a painter, which is what he really wanted to do so that he can be an architect because that's where you meet the best people, according to his mother. Um, he even en ends up giving up Dominique then because he can get a commission from Wynand out of it. So... Uh, he really does seem to be making his choices based on the values of other people, what's considered prestigious, what's considered popular, what's considered acceptable. So I'm really glad that uh, Seun mentioned that line about what the soul or the self actually is. Uh, I'll just also quickly mention one thing that's interesting also about this scene which Seun didn't mention, um, which I you know, was really hoping somebody would notice, but it's, this one was more of a stretch to notice. It's that in the same scene, what... Dominique and Peter are talking about before they have this conversation is how Keating has just read the book, The Gallant Gallstone, which is uh, one of these avant-garde no uh, novels, w the main thesis of which is there to disprove the existence of free will. And then once Dominique uh, asserts that it's really Pete Peter who doesn't have an eye, Peter who doesn't have a soul, and when he doesn't want to accept this, uh, part of what he uses to distract himself from this is the fact that uh, Ellsworth Dewey knocks on the door and they start having a conversation immediately about the gallant gallstone. Again, this idea that there is no free will is the, the main thesis of that book. And I'll just remind you, that's the same idea that gives him reassurance, uh, I think, when he's talking about how everyone is selfish, because if nobody has any free will with regards to that issue, then everybody's bound to do the bad things that he does. Although, as it turns out, what he means by selfishness uh, is is not anything like the notion of selfishness that the the novel is actually speaking to here that the not that Rourke is embodying he's not selfish in the way that Rourke 
is selfish. He's because he's lost the thing that you have to be concerned with if uh, if you really are to be selfish, and that's yourself, the basic values that you've chosen for yourself and by yourself. Um, so he's uh, there's all kinds of things that he's trying to uh, ignore in this situation that are very interesting. But Sam, I think uh, now is a good time to uh, get to our second place winners. So let's let's have yes. a let's have a drum roll. And our second place winners, some of these names you will recognize. Zara Deniva from Van Damme Academy in California, Linnea Malmberg uh, from Midwest City, Oklahoma, and Victor Zhang, uh, Bayside High School in Bayside, New York. We got uh, some of their pictures here. Glad to see they were able to share those with us. I don't think they're doing it um, too promiscuously. This is, the, I think they're happy to, to let other people know that they've done something that's actually very admirable here. And we're happy to share that with you as well. Uh, so congratulations to those second place winners. I think uh, that's the, how much is the prize for second place again, Sam? That's, um, that, that is, that, that is, one is uh, that's... $1,000. So enjoy that well-earned money, Zara, Linnea, and Victor. And some of you already now know who the first place uh, winner is, but we'll still build up to that uh, by talking about some of the excerpts related to the third prompt so uh where did our third yes go? let's turn to the third prompt now um for this one is one where we will talk about uh the character who showed up in the last excerpt on the previous prompt uh dominique and the third prompt reads dominique says to alva scarrett i take the only desire one can really permit oneself Freedom, Alva, freedom. To ask nothing, to expect nothing, to depend on nothing. We asked, what does Dominique mean by this? And how does she act on her view over the course of the novel? What is Dominique's perspective on this kind of freedom at the end of the novel, and why? So Ben, do you want to take us to the first excerpt that we had? On this yeah and i'll just mention one thing about this question which is which is that um so dominique's a complex character there are things about her that i think the author of the novel means to celebrate there are things about her that the author means to criticize and you can tell she goes through a lot of development over the course of this novel and uh, this question is actually about that development and part of why this is a challenging question is because, well, freedom is something that sounds pretty good. And I mean, the author herself, Ayn Rand, spoke highly of uh, individual freedom in a political context. And so part of the reason this is a challenging question is because it, it, it challenges the students, the, the authors of these essays to figure out, well, is this one of the things that uh, Dominique, uh, that's good about Dominique? Or is this one of the things that Dominique has to grow out of? Uh, and uh, there's another reason that's interesting about this question that I'll get to at the end, but um, let's start with an excerpt, which I think sums up a really, it gives a really good summary of the predicament that Dominique finds herself in at the beginning of the novel, because she, she is a complex character. She faces, she's filled with contradictions, and part of the development that she goes through is with regard to resolving those contradictions. So here's Hannah Wall's statement of Dominique's predicament, which she uses to get the essay started. She writes, Dominique's ability to see and cherish greatness is a blessing and a curse. She appreciates pure human greatness, but her belief that greatness will never have a fighting chance against society causes her to destroy everything great she obtains. Her idealism fights against her pessimism. She refuses to read a great book a second time. She destroys the statue of Helios. And during the first two parts of the Fountainhead, she tries to destroy Howard Rourke. She believes it is almost a mercy killing to destroy Rourke before the world destroys him. Dominique does this out of love for his work. These acts of destruction agree with her views of rejecting any connection to society. So in this particular passage, uh, Hannah doesn't mention the issue of freedom, but just to make that connection explicit, I mean, she does elsewhere in the paper, but 
uh, just to make that explicit. The idea here is if, if what Hannah's saying is Dominique admires greatness. She admires uh, heroic people and achievements in the world, but she, she also fears that they will be destroyed uh, by the villains of the world. And so she doesn't want to see that suffering. That's part of the why, reason why she's describing what Dominique is trying to do in effect as a kind of mercy killing. And so uh, she mentions the example of throwing the statue of Helios, Helios down the air shaft. Uh, that's actually something she's just done uh, when she's explaining to Alva Scarrett uh, her view of freedom. And it, it, that view sums it up because if she, if she thinks greatness in the world is threatened and she doesn't want to see it destroyed, she, well, she'd rather destroy it herself because she wants to be free from the pain of seeing it destroyed by someone else. And so she values the freedom of asking for nothing, expecting nothing, depending on nothing, because then if you don't depend on anything, you, you won't be disappointed when it's uh, taken away from you. Yeah, so, so let's now I think go ahead to the next excerpt, which I think has, has uh, more to say in this regard, also setting up her predicament. Yes, yeah. This second excerpt is from Anna Lai from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, and there, this is the opening, and it's going to tie in with the closing of her essay as well, which we'll read shortly after. So Anna's essay begins. On April 23rd, 1910, President Theodore Roosevelt delivered his The Man in the Arena speech in Paris, France, stating, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. In the Fountainhead, Dominique Francon defines freedom as asking, expecting, and depending on nothing with no will to dare greatly. While her lover, Howard Rourke, can be described as the man in the arena, Dominique chooses to live as a perfectly integrated member of society, remaining on the sidelines. And I think this is a great, uh, a great image to use to illustrate this, this difference between Rourke and Dominique. Uh, and this connects into the idea that uh, Ben was just talking about, the idea that uh, if you never enter the arena, uh, you're, not, you're not going to uh, feel the pain of losing, which she thinks is, she thinks that loss, that disappointment, the destruction of greatness is inevitable. Uh, so she chooses to stay on the outside and, and not take the chance, not as, as, uh, Anna put it, not to dare greatly. And as uh, good essays often do, uh, this one circles back to the same imagery at the, at the end. And so here's the closing passage, uh, again from, from Anna. Throughout the novel, Dominique has chosen to enter the arena in her own ways. At the end of the novel, Dominique does not suddenly enter the arena. Her change in perspective of freedom simply allows her to live in the arena without the feeling of existential dread. With a new frame of mind, she grants herself the courage to be vulnerable and embrace the possibilities of both joy and suffering uh, in one lifetime. So I, I just thought, I thought this was a fantastic opening and closing, not just because it comes full circle in that way, but also because, well, you often read student papers where they, they want to uh, introduce the paper by bringing in some kind of canned quotation from a quote book or something. And it's maybe it's on the same topic uh, as, as the, uh, the theme of the essay. Uh, I don't get the sense that that's what was happening here. Uh, it seems like the student is familiar with this speech and recognizes this theme. And it really is applicable. I think it really is a good metaphor for the the kind of question that's facing Dominique. And then uh, the author here had a good way of teasing out the different aspects of the metaphor, showing how they uh, how they apply in different ways to the characters in the story. That's of course just the beginning and the end of the essay. She had a lot to say in the middle, uh, substantiating all of this. Um, but let's take a look at some other excerpts, Sam, uh, from students uh, and what they said uh, in the middle portion of their essay to, to do that substantiation. 
Yeah, uh, because part of the essay question was to ask about how uh, how Dominique's view changes over the course of the novel. And uh, Victor Zhang wrote some about uh, the kind of journey that Dominique goes on. And Victor wrote, Dominique actively tries to destroy Rourke in order to protect him, as the world does not have a right to view his work or destroy him. In a way, Dominique also does this to test her ideas, as if Rourke succeeds, even if she actively blocks his way, it shows true greatness can thrive, even in a mediocre society. Dominique gains a glimmer of hope when Rourke's career starts showing signs of success. Yeah, a number of students made observations about the ways in which Rourke uh, plays a role in Dominique's change. The fact that she see the way that she sees him winning over the course of the novel, in spite of uh, the obstacles he's up up against, that plays a role in her seeing that she she doesn't have to expect that greatness will always be destroyed. Uh, but one thing I really liked about Victor's passage here is that it, it, it emphasizes her own agency here. And this is something that um, uh, Zara, or sorry, Anna, was actually uh, referring to earlier, saying there's ways in which, in spite of her own thinking, she actually is in the, re the arena here. You know, she, she likes to pretend that she's not in the arena, that she's just passively sitting back and observing things. But she is, she is actually doing things in the course of this novel that push, it, that push the plot forward, kind of in spite of her own... Uh, in spite of herself, uh, there is a way in which she's she's putting Rourke to the test. It's not just detached observations that she's making of him. She's she's kind of doing a little experiment, and it's kind of it's it's a weird experiment, and it's one that makes a lot of people wonder why is she doing that. Uh, but because she has these these deep metaphysical problems and contradictions that she's trying to resolve, some kind of experiment is is necessary. And Victor described that really well, I think. We've got one last excerpt, and uh, this is uh, from one of our previous uh, winners, which I think gives a really good statement of Dominique's of, of the of the final view that the novel takes about about freedom, and uh, why it thinks Dominique's original view of freedom is a mistake, and what view she comes to adopt instead. This is from Vanessa Virgil, uh, Parkside High School in Salisbury, Maryland. She writes, Dominique acts on her freedom by having nothing to achieve and destroying everything she enjoys. Her freedom is not true freedom because instead of being free to be happy in her own way, she's bound by the fear of society. Her love for Rourke and his creations keeps being interrupted by what she knows the world will think and do to them. After Rourke retaliates and blows up the altered Cortland building he carefully, that he carefully designed, Dominique realizes that the world has never had power over Rourke, her and every other individualist in the system. Uh, one thing I really liked about Vanessa's passage here is she's thinking more, she's thinking pretty deeply about the psychology of this view of freedom that Dominique starts out with. You know, you might hear freedom and think, well, that's a value that people love, but what the kind of freedom that Dominique is really pursuing is, is more of something you adopt out of fear, you're f out of the fear of loss. It's not something adopted out of love. and and uh, Vanessa even pits love versus fear here, which I think is really insightful because those are two uh, opposing kinds of motivations. Uh, another thing I liked about this is that it it really brings out one of the reasons that I thought this was an important question to ask students about. And one of the reasons we picked this essay topic, because this idea that there's a kind of freedom in expecting nothing and depending on nothing because you're afraid of losing. Uh, this is an attitude that is becoming, unfortunately, I think, uh, increasingly popular in our world today, uh, especially under the influence of the philosophy of Stoicism. There's been this uh, renewed interest in ancient Stoic philosophy, the idea that uh, we should, the only way to really be happy is, is to not suffer and to not suffer loss and therefore to uh, not make too many attachments to things in the world. Uh, and uh, there's a way in which Dominique's original view, this view of freedom uh, from uh, dependencies on things in the world, uh, is, is very much the same idea that the, the Stoic philosophers pushed. And you sometimes hear people think that Rourke 
was kind of stoic, well, because he doesn't get too angry at people. But that's not really what stoicism means. In a lot of ways, Rourke is the opposite of a stoic. He's somebody who values deeply, who pursues his values, and who isn't afraid about the possibility of loss uh, as he seeks to achieve them. And part of what he's doing in the course of the novel is showing that uh, Dominique uh, can find something like that within herself as well. So, uh, so no further reason it's... to wait, especially for those of you who have been paying attention, but we should, we should do first place. All right, first place winner is Anna Lai, uh, who is a 12th grade student at John F. Kennedy High School, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Congratulations, Anna. Uh, very, very well done, and I hope you enjoy the $5,000 prize. And it wasn't just because of the opening and the closing of uh, Anna's essay that, that we awarded that prize. There was a lot of other good stuff in there too, but that, that was something that we wanted to spotlight in particular. Um, so, uh, we don't want to go without mentioning, uh, that there were a lot of finalists and semi-finalists. We're not going to be able to read, uh, all of, all of their names, but let's put up on screen, at least the list of the finalists who, who won a hundred dollars. Uh, you do see Tom Jongaline, Jongaline in there. We used one of his essay excerpts previously. Congratulations, Tom, and all of the rest of you spend that a hundred dollars well. And we also, and have... we'll also put up the. Yeah, we also have our semi-finalists. Uh, so we will put up a list of their names. Again, there are too many for us to read all of them, but we ha congratulate our, our semi-finalists and uh, we hope that you enjoy your $25 prize. We'd like to thank everybody uh, for attending today and for participating. And once again, extra thanks uh, should be extended to the donors. Uh, at the Ayn Rand Institute who made this prize money possible. Uh, we hope that the, the winners are very thankful for that. Uh, and whether you won the contest or not, uh, we'd like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, you can receive uh, a free book by Ayn Rand if you go to aynrand.org slash free books. Uh, maybe you're watching this, you'd like to participate in next year's contest. Maybe you participated in this year's contest but didn't place. Uh, it's always possible, I think, to, to write a number of years in a row. And so, uh, or, or perhaps you, you did the Anthem contest, but now you want to do the Fountainhead contest. You can order a copy of the Fountainhead or Anthem or Atlas Shrugged or any number of books by Ayn Rand at aynrand.org slash free books. And we do want to encourage uh, you to enter next year's contest. We run these contests annually. And uh, we invite uh, anyone who is still uh, in, the, in the eligible grade levels uh, to enter the next year, year's contest. If you uh, came, came close and were one of our finalists and didn't, did not quite reach the top prize, that uh, we'd love to see you enter next year. Or if you're just someone who's interested in, in uh, giving it a shot, um, the website for the essay contests is einrand.org slash contests. And as Ben mentioned, the Fountainhead is not the only uh, essay contest we have. We have three of them uh, for the Fountainhead and also for Anthem and Atlas Shrugged. Uh, so if you uh, want to try your hand at a, at a different book, go ahead and see those contests as well. Great. And we'll also be uh, putting up information on our website uh, with the lists of names that you saw previously. We'll also be putting up the winning essay by Anna. So if you're interested in taking a look at that whole essay, see what a first place Fountainhead essay looks like, you'll, you're, you're going to be able to do that. We'll also be emailing all of you who uh, were finalists or semifinalists with news about that, and uh, also a lot of other action items for you, uh, ways to learn more about Ayn Rand's ideas, ways to follow up by uh, learning, uh, taking courses, places like the Ayn Rand University, which is sponsored by the Ayn Rand Institute, which is what we work for. Um, so we're, we're hoping to see some of you again, if not, uh, if not in any of those programs, then at least uh, perhaps uh, with another essay contest, essay contest uh, entry. Uh, and if 
don't worry if you're if you're a senior in high school, you've just graduated and can't do the Fountainhead contest anymore. You are still able to do the Atlas Shrug contest. Uh, we uh, we offer that to college students. So hope to see many of you then and there. Otherwise, I think we're ready to wrap up. So uh, thanks, Sam, so much for joining me, helping me celebrate uh, the winners of the Fountainhead contest. Thanks, Ben, and uh, thanks everyone for watching and congratulations to all the winners. And we'll be announcing the winners of the Anthem contest, uh, this year's Anthem contest, which is for a, a younger class of, of writers uh, tomorrow evening, uh, same time, same place, I believe, on our social media channel. So stay tuned if you are interested in that. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Thanks.